Every day, various Nigerian communities record hundreds of deaths and injuries to their locals. Families lose their loved ones and are rendered homeless even afterwards, walking miles to seek refuge in camps and other communities. In the new communities, they're hardly safe as the next attack may just be on the way. Where the story is rarely told and when told, often missing vital details, the true state of events and the gory scenes are barely painted. On VSA Today, we'll be speaking to some of the people affected by the recent security crisis in Zango Kataf, a community in southern Kaduna and Rigwe in Plateau State. Welcome to VSA and Suleiman. Now, security challenges faced by the people of Zango Kataf in southern Kaduna State, uh, state dates back in history. For many decades, uh, there's been a local battle between the traditional settlers of a community known as the Achiap people and the Hausas. Now, clashes between locals and militia have often led to the death of hundreds of people and the burning of houses and businesses, leaving many homeless and some others leaving in IDP camps. The latest has seen the killing of at least 32 people and four villages sacked. Local dwellers are on the run for their dear lives. Like Zango Kataf in Kaduna, the people of Rigwe, Basaloka government area of Plateau State face similar challenges. Now, between the 31st of July and 4th of August, 70 people were killed in various Rigwe communities. More than 2,500 houses burnt and over a thousand hectares of farmlands destroyed. 25,000 people have also been displaced from their homes, that's according to eyewitness accounts. From Kaduna to Plateau to every other part of Nigeria, the history long abandoned yet important is haunting the times and haunting the people. Avoidable clashes have become the order of the day and peace has become a privilege. Now, to feel the pulse of the people and know the level of devastation in those communities, I have today Nura Bako Zango, a native of Zango Katav in Kaduna State, who will be joining me via phone, and Lawrence Zongo, who is the Publicity Secretary of the Youth Movement in Plateau State. Gentlemen, many thanks uh, for joining us. And uh, let's uh, start to, uh, with Nura, who is on the phone. Nura, you live in Zango Katav. Can you give us a detailed account of what's going on in your community and the local government? Thank you very much for having me in this program. Can you hear me, please? Go ahead. You're welcome. I can hear you. Yes, thank you very much for having me in this program. The conflict in Southern Sabuna and Zongon Kater in particular is as long and complicated. It is a conflict or crisis that lingered for over 30 years. It started in 1992 due to, you know, the location of market, uh, farm, uh, farmland dispute, as well as uplifting of crops. That was what led to some of the immediate and, you know, root causes of the crisis of 1992 which rendered my community jungle urban completely displaced. However, after that, uh, after that crisis, a committee, of, uh, a committee was set in order to reconcile the two warring parties by the then government, military government, under the common law of the public So he set up a committee headed by A.G. and Usman Mu'ami. So the committee has brought the two warring parties together in order to reconcile them. Unfortunately, the committee fell out, fell out. Then the governor himself, the governor himself organized what we call a peace party in government based secondary school, Dongo, Dongo in nineteen ninety-five. It was at that party that the two parties have made some agreements and pledges. They have also made some demands from the government. So the actors on their side 
acknowledge the fact that they have confiscated land belonging to the indigenous of Zongo, house people of Zongo, Zongo urban. They acknowledge that fact. So they promise that they, in, in as much as a freedom is created, because that was uh, during that time we were all under the Zongo Emirates. We are we are all under the Zongo Emirates. The district head was set. We were sent from Zaria. So the idea demanded for the creation of Akia children, based on the fact that, according to them, that they were not from the same religion, from the same culture with the people of Zaria. So, so in so other words, uh, uh, allow me, allow me come in here quickly, uh, Nora. Sorry to cut you. Uh, I'll come back to you, but it would seem as if some of the key things you take taking this back to the early 90s, specifically 1992. And uh, it looks like it has turned into what you would want to call uh, a tribal and sometimes religious crisis. Uh, is that what it is? Yes. Uh, this crisis, uh, in some of the crisis is both religious and ethnic. Okay, then. I I'll, it come back, I'll come back to you, uh, Nura, so that we can stretch that. Let me quickly get uh, to Plateau State, where Lawrence is. Lawrence, good to see you. And uh, thanks for your time. I said uh, last week uh, on the show, the National Publicity Secretary of the Rigue Development Association told us 70 people had died and more than 25,000 were displaced after uh, the Fulani militia attacks. Uh, that's uh, according to him. What's the current situation in Rigue at the moment? Yeah, thank you for this opportunity given to me. The situation is still becoming worse and is, is actually dangerous for us. And those houses being shown um, on the screen um, just recently is actually from Uruguay. Chiefdom and also an orphanage home being destroyed and burned down. And not only that, crops were being destroyed just as the National Publicity Secretary said, um, Davidson Madison. And also this issues now is now changing back to another sad situation where by the way these Fulani militias have destroyed they are now going back to those community grazing their cattle and also destroying more houses and the fact remains to were recovering more dead bodies because some were missing some have been missed missing uh, uh, for, for for a very long time and so since then, we're now getting more dead bodies. So it's equal to almost 80 now that we're recovering dead bodies now. It's so very painful that um, no one is there for us to wipe our tears for us. We, we, we have a failed government. We have a government that don't care about these people. We have a government that look into others as second um, citizens. We have a government that only when the attacks occur, they don't speak on justice, but they kind of, they, they, they only make press statements that they're not yielding results. They are kind of a government that their judgment system is one-sided in favor of the Muslim flag militants. This is um, what is going on. It's actually a genocide. I pity some of the national um, dailies, some bloggers, um, some fake organization coming up to say that it is a clash um, between headers farmers. Like this is a coalition of peace practitioner in Plato State. These are some of these groups that they don't know what is going on. They assume after collecting money from the paymasters, they will come up and give lies, bad reports. They don't visit such area. They don't know what is going on. They give lies. They say well, there's a well, clash. I, I, anyway, yes. let, me, let, me, let, me, let me interject to you there, Lawrence, uh, uh, because basically that's the whole essence why you are on live television uh, and uh, we're speaking with uh, people of communities. And uh, as, uh, at the moment, we're also trying to get the other side of the story, uh, speak to those uh, you have alleged, uh, trying to find uh, the Fulanese uh, to also speak to us. Now, Let's establish some of the key things that you're saying. You did say earlier on that this is not a crisis or a clash, but a genocide, which means it's a systematic, deliberate, intentional move 
to kill some people. Uh, is that what you're saying it is? Yes, it's a systematic movement to kill some group of people because of their feet. And also there's land grabbing in it. Nigerian, I, I addressed it um, last time on my social media. I just um, clear it up and give it a very um, acceptable definition by me. Nigeria is becoming a road to death, a, a burial ground for Christians in Plateau State. It's so very bad to tell you, if only this is going on, why burning of churches is becoming very rich. More than 15 churches now born. And also an orphanage home, mainly for those that have been displaced, staying there now, destroy and burn. Hospitals you know, you know, that have know, been uh, used. Again, cleanly. again, do you know the people perpetrating this? Because uh, uh, a lot of times when people come on television, they say headsmen. And uh, the national uh, publicity sector was here, and he once said that these were people who were also living amongst you once upon a time. So are these recognized people who come and burn houses and religious uh, worship centers? Yeah, well, let me say it, being to be, to say that is a systematic event going on there. The militias, they have been harbored by these Fulanis that we stay with them. This is how, because they are the one taking them to places. Areas located where these people are staying, we know those places. The military know, the government knows all these places, but they're not willing to go after them. One of those places is called Rakumbona. This is where their headquarters, where they have been staying there. And also we have Marabandere. It's another place where these flags are staying there. We have a lot of other neighboring communities where this is their location, is their base. And they all know it. The military are not after to to investigate such things very well. And to tell you again, I won't say um, to make any critics against the, to, to not appreciate the effort of the military to some extent, because some of the military or personnel were killed too. And where it pays me that they even overpowered the Nigerian military. You, you know, it's quickly here, quickly here. Yeah, if you say, if you bring in this, uh, also bring in the, the the activities or the help uh, rendered by the military, you also before then said that your state government is aware of where these killers are holding out and uh, they're helpless. What's the last communication you got from your state government? Well. The state governor, I think, is one of the worst governor we so ever have. The state that don't care about but, the welfare. Why, why, why would you? Why would you? Why? Would you, because these these are very harsh words, and you know, why would you call your state governor the worst? Yeah, he don't care about the life of of his own people. This so, is actually so when you say person. when you say because the governor is not here today, when you say the governor doesn't care about uh, what's happening, uh, what informed this decision? We've, we've seen the governor, you know, on television talk about the killings going on in Plateau State. What else would you have loved to see the governor do? Yeah, the governor has, some, uh, has a basic responsibility in ensuring life and properties being protected. And also, there's some certain concern that we have to see from a governor that coming down to the community. As I'm telling you, this attack started since from 27th of July till 2nd August. No any condolence from the governor. Talk less of taking an action to ensuring these criminals, these terrorists are brought to book. Or then on whose, on, whose, on whose order uh, is, the, is the military acting at the moment? Yeah, the military are acting under the 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 sector commander that's um um general general s i ali is actually the commander there good, good, and good also thing. you know you know lawrence uh, you, you know good thing as as bad as this is but is is good a thing that you, you you are on the ground and you also know the name of the commander who is uh, commanding the the army in that in that locality uh, we're hoping that uh, we should be able to also get to the Plateau State Governor. But quickly, a, a moment here. Let me quickly get to Kaduna, where 
uh, Nura is. And Nura, you know, uh, quickly here, you know, th there are a lot of other things happening in your state. There's a history of ethnic and religious tensions stemming from the establishment of these communities uh, you spoke about in your opening. What are the traditional rulers in these communities doing, and what do you understand from this history? Thank you very much for this very wonderful question. You know, last year, uh, immediately uh, after, 19, after 1992 crisis, after those reconciliations, the town uh, came back to normal, and we have ne ne not experienced any form of violence again last year. So what happened last year was so the Atia people found a dead body on a park in a place called Kurumi Matara. And the place is four to four kilometers from Bongo Urban. Now, when they found that dead body, they're supposed to investigate or report to the security. So they did not do that. They took the law into their hands and came in thousands in order to our community, Rongo Urban. So, due to the swift response of the agencies, they could not be able to attack the community. They went to the what? To the, to the bushes, where they live with Fulani and started killing the Arugas, killing their people and burning the Arugas in their, 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 their heritage, which is their cows. That was what happened last year. So, later, there were a series of repressal attacks. And yes. You know, Pulani people have something. something. They are all like Hausa people. You can, you, can, you can kill Hausa people. They will say that it is the will of God. They will forgive and forget. But some of our Pulani brothers find it very difficult to forget and forgive. So after their communities, after their rulers, Allow me coming here quickly. You you just you just referred you just you referred to these uh, people as you know some of our Fulani brothers. And the question Africa is asking: if these are uh, seen as siblings and brothers, why is it so difficult for traditional rulers and the government, especially in Kaduna State, to come together? you know, to actually, you know, bring about the much-needed peace between these communities. I'm coming, sir. The traditional ruler in the kingdom is called Agon Asiyab, Sir Dominic Dengorahan. So after those crises here and there, he organized a peace meeting in Angoma City. He called on the warring party. He called on the house. He called on Fulani, and he called on his brother. There was a peace and I could remember vividly part of the part is that is that they have agreed in peace. Since we are all Nigerians, no one has the right to deprive another of his work, of his belonging or no one has the right to another out of his own territory. So they they they, they have promised not to engage in you know blocking of a mounting of illegal roadblocks on a road. Because anything that happens, the Atia militia, mounting indigenous roadblocks, innocent passers by that are not even in of that place. So at that moment, they promised not to do that again. So unfortunately, as soon as our Atia finished that meeting, as soon as that meeting was finished, concluded, the Atia militia continued with their, with their gorilla attack. One want to name and here. Another pull an email there, yeah, they will they will shoot they, they will shoot the house, they will in fact that was that is exactly what is happening right now in Gongon Kato. And here again, July, eleventh July on Friday, there there is a contentious land. There is a land is a bone of contention between Hausa Hausa of Zongo and the Asia people. So last year when it happened has warned everyone not to cultivate the land. They, it, ha, it has warned everyone to be thieves from cultivating the land. Spending on it, it, it reduced its it, it reduce it, um, 
it, it white paper on the other issues. So the actors came in to cultivate the land, and some of them were shooting in our presence. They were shooting. And others went to one Ruga, I know the Ruga in Madania. We call it Ruben Ar Otonko. They went there and bore on the Ruga. In fact, the Fulani narrowly escaped. Again, in general, they went there and born at the, the Ruga. Yes, Nora again, uh, Nora again uh, allow me to butt in here. Uh, again, if we get a sense of what you're saying, it looks like, um, uh, you know, a case of reprisals, uh, you know, from both sides, uh, you know. Uh, and if this is what is happening, and history has told us that uh, this has actually been on for a lot of times, many years, and uh, if the state and the governments, both the military and civilians, have struggled to find a lasting solution to this, and it still persists, as a native, uh, uh, Nura, uh, with a sound understanding of these problems, what do you suggest will bring an end to the problems? Thank you very much, sir. There are possible solutions to this problem. One, one, there is what is called indigenous secular, uh, secular dichotomy in southern Kaduna. That one should be abolished. Because to them, to Asiaf and their allies, any Muslim, no matter the language he speaks, is a secular in southern Kaduna, irrespective of the number of centuries that they spent there. Like my son, Zongo Oban. Zongo has, was founded over 500,000 years. And up to now, to them, we are settlers. So if they can discuss that indigenous secular dichotomy and ideology, peace will reign. That is one. Secondly, secondly, they are elite. They are elite. Some of them are in Abuja. Some of them are in Kaduna. Some of them are in Lego. They will sit in the comfort of their room, whining and dining with other people. Other people that are not even from their faith. But they will be instigating their youth to carry the law into their hands. So if those elites should come together to stop that thing, actually peace will be maintained. Secondly, secondly, we we should all learn to accept what we call diversity. We are we are a homogeneous people, but created in a highly heterogeneous way by God. So when He created us, He uh, based on His wisdom. He marched us in the same place in order to live in peace. So if we can be able to accept diversity, respect each other's culture, respect one another's tradition, respect, uh, tolerate each other's religion, then peace will be maintained. Secondly, uh, another one, another point is that traditional rulers also play a very important role in maintaining peace in any community. So a traditional ruler should not be biased in administration of justice. They shouldn't be biased in administering justice to, 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 their, to their residents. Because to me, whoever is living in Asiaf land is under the Abu Asiaf, whether he is Asiaf, Hausa, Fulani, or any language, he is under Abu Asiaf. So if Abu Asiaf and other traditional rulers can put their heads together, forget about their religious or tribal differences, in order to come up with workable solutions, dialogue, you know, enlightening people, foreign villages, enlightening people about the importance of living in peace. I believe, I believe peace will, will be maintained. But most importantly, government should, as a matter of urgency, as a matter of urgency, implement some of the recommendations of the Judicial Commission of Inquiry. You know, there are recommendations made by previous Judicial Commission of Inquiries, which were neglected by the previous government. So if government can come up with strategies in order to at least implement some of them, not even all, some of them, I believe peace will, will be maintained. Mm. Perpetrators as well as masterminds of crime must be punished. They must be they must save the music. They must be brought to justice. Justice. I believe peace will be maintained. But if any of this, any of this is not put in place, I don't think there will be peace in Southern Kaduna.
Okay, um, I think it's a fine place for us uh, to go on a break. We'll come back to you, uh, Lawrence uh, and Noura. Uh, good to know that both of you are still there. And, of course, uh, Noura has raised quite a lot of points here. And uh, when we come back, I'll be asking to speak in, uh, to some of the eyewitnesses and indigent, indigents, I beg your pardon, who are right there in Plateau State. But uh, some of the key points Lawrence, I mean, Noura has raised is... Uh, for traditional rulers not to be biased, especially in the administration of justice, and also look at uh, the past recommendations by different committees that have been set up in the very, very, uh, you know, distant past and also near, you know, past to see how this can actually be resolved. When we come back, more on these issues of crisis in Zangu Kataf in Kaduna State as well as Rigwe community in Plateau State. Stay with us. Well, good to have you back again here on VSA. And uh, we're looking at the crisis in two states uh, in Nigeria, Kaduna and Plateau specifically. Now, the allegations are the same, listening to uh, both Nora and Lawrence. And the context of the attack seems similar and looks to be a critical area the Nigerian government must look into to avoid future occurrences of such a nature. There are weighty allegations, uh, yes, uh, from... Uh, uh, our guest, but the indigenous people of Rigwe and Zangu Katai have raised our lamps over attempts to drive them out of their ancestral lands and in both cases by militias. An orphanage supported by a US based non governmental organization was also burnt in the attack, raising questions about the protection of kids and women. Now, the children, most of whom were left homeless by Boko Haram, have now been left homeless by recent attacks on the only place they can call home. All eyes are on Plateau, Kaduna, and Nigerian governments to make rapid moves to nip this historic trouble in the bud. I still have uh, Lawrence and Nura with me. So let's uh, go to uh, Plateau State, where Lawrence is. Uh, good to see uh, that you're still there for us, uh, Lawrence. Uh, you've been reporting these killings and attacks for some time, Lawrence. And uh, what have been your experiences uh, so far? Yeah, my experience so far is lack of justice all the way through all this injustice. And let me say this, um, to give a recap on everything that happened from 2016 and any other attacks, but the one that hit from 2016 to date, my experience so far, I've never seen a justice system where we have a government that is coming down to ensure justice for the Uruguay people and also for the displaced people. Apart from this year attack, there are previous attacks that actually destroyed houses were born to, people were killed. We record over 700 people now killed in Uruguay by these militias. It pays us that every day we're burying people, every day we cry, we dry our tears from people that we fed them, from people that they stay with us, from people that we give them what to eat, we took care of them. But we have a few government. Sometimes I always say I don't blame the Flanese, but I blame the type of government we have that don't care 
for its own people from the federal to the state government. We've never seen to, to an, an, a, a situation whereby the state government have um, sympathy, care, love for these very people um, facing this attack. It's always dangerous that 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 is um, going to your farm now is a risk. It's just like committing suicide because definitely you will be killed. So no need of you going to farm. Fear. So, Fear. so uh, at, the, at the moment, at the moment, uh, you already you already uh, told us that the government of uh, your state uh, isn't uh, you know up to uh, fixing uh, the mess. But uh, talking about farms and uh, the grassroots people. Um, Perhaps let's have a sense of what they feel, if we can actually speak to some of those uh, uh, who are yet there with you. I'd I like to have a, a sense of what uh, they're going through at the moment, uh, if they're farmers, if uh, you know those that have been affected. Uh, it's about time we gave them voice uh, so that the world uh, can understand what they're going through and uh, get a sense of what uh, your people uh, are dealing with uh, at the moment, if you understand what I mean, Lawrence. Uh, so um, uh, we had uh, some people uh, come over your place uh, so that they can use uh, the uh, connection to speak with us. So can uh, can I speak with anyone who's there with you at the moment? Yes, we have two of them. One is uh, from the Neighborhood Watch. One is also a uh, community resident. At least they can they have good statement to say. Let me excuse them. So, and, um, so, so the, the, the issue uh, or what, what we, we have at the moment uh, has to do with uh, some of those key things raised by Noura, who is uh, uh, based in Kaduna State, talking about uh, bias uh, that he has also seen in the, past, uh, in, in, the, in the past concerning the administration of justice, especially from traditional rulers. Uh, he's uh, uh, calling for uh, uh, you know, a re a look into such. Now I have a uh, uh, good to see you and uh, may we meet you. Yes. Um, Moses Kadia. So, so, so Moses, uh, um, you, are, you are one of those uh, uh, we asked to, to, to come over to, uh, to Lawrence uh, so that we can speak with you on the crisis yeah. going on in Rigue community. Tell us uh, your experience uh, so far. Mm -hmm. Indeed, it's a very, very pathetic experience because what we have gone through, we have gone through a lot of things and um, we are traumatized. Uh, the entire community, we are, we are indeed, uh, in fact, we have a terrible experience. From your experience, uh, has there been any formal, you know, help, uh, apart from the military that uh, has been trying to secure your neighborhood, um, what is the police doing to also help uh, bring about or maintain law and order in your community? Okay. Initially, uh, uh, before this attack, this second August attack, Indeed, uh, there were no army within my community. There were police in my community. So only policemen were there uh, while the, the, our plants, our crops have been destroyed. And um, indeed, the same police with uh, APC, that's Armor Personal Carrier uh, Van that used to patrol in that community with some helices, police helices. So they were there, they were doing nothing as far as we are concerned. Because when there is, uh, when there is an attack, or if the Fulani militia are grazing on our farmlands, when we call them, they will only go there and watch them doing all the damages that they are doing, destroying the farms, and they didn't, there was no action that was taken, either by stopping them from doing that, uh, destroying our farmlands, 
they will just remain mute. And they, after watching them for a while, they also go back. And the funny thing, we were, we, the inhabitants of that community, we were the people even fueling the APC van. But instead of them to help us so that our crops will not be damaged, but when they go there, they only watch them. That is the experience I had. Well, thank you very much, uh, Moses Kadia, and I'm hoping that, that uh, well, help uh, will come. And uh, l let me take this uh, to uh, very quickly to uh, Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence, uh, this uh, will go to you quickly here. Um, perhaps uh, we should start talking about the grassroots leaders uh, who are there and uh, the kind of uh, uh, way and manner they're handling this. If your government, according to you, uh, isn't working to seeing that uh, this stops. Um, what have the grassroots leaders done to make the message clearer, especially to the government on your behalf? All right, we have our local vigilante, and they have been doing their best to ensure internal security against invaders. But the challenges that they are having they are not allowed to hold these types of guns that these Fulanis are having because it's against the law. Remember, I said the, the justice system in Nigeria is one-sided, is in favor of a particular tribe and not other tribes also not having such type of favor. They are allowed it, it, to is, is, there, is there a portion of the Nigerian constitution that specifically, you know, uh, states uh, what you've just highlighted, uh, where... Uh, a part of the country, uh, you know, is giving such powers to own, uh, you know, such uh, ammunition, while another part isn't g getting such power. Is that yep. in the Nigerian constitution? Yes, but from what we're seeing, this no, is no, what no, is no, going. I, 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 let me get to you. Did you say yes? Is there a part in, of the constitution, of the Nigerian constitution, that stipulates a part of the country can, you know, bear arms <laughs> and another part can't? No, there is no any constitution that is saying that, but from what we're seeing presently today, it gives us that direction, that way of um, to think that, yes, this is what is going on in the country. Okay, because, it, it is um, an assumption. Yes, but it's actually the reality. It's actually what? That's the reality, what is going on. Okay, but it's not the way you painted it that there is, uh, because you said that constitutionally, uh, some parts of Nigeria uh, are given the powers to bear arms no, and the other parts. I just said it's constitutionally. I didn't say it's constitutionally. But I said the government, the justice system in Nigeria is actually one sided. The justice system is in favor of a particular tribe. Uh, is there is there a reason or are there reasons why you, yes. you have said this? The basic reason over there, with our experience so far over since when this attack has been going on, let me say from 2017, we had a very big experience whereby 29 people were killed in a classroom. And how were they killed? There was actually negligence of the Nigerian military over there, over that incident. And was there any steps being carried out to ensure that this, these people were being persecuted? Do you know being 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 kind of go, go, going to go to be punished? Nothing was done to 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 this, and no investigation have been done. No any report, despite all our complaints, despite all reports we've been given that this is what is going on. They care nothing about us. How do you want us to think that the justice system is not in our own favor? It is so, and it's clear because we're seeing it. We're home. We're seeing what is going on. Even sometimes calling the military to tell them this is what is going on. They don't take quick action over it. Sometimes again, I said I don't always blame the military to some extent because what if they're not well equipped? I remember there was a Nigerian, uh, 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 an STF um, officer. Um, not to mention his name, he clearly said that sometimes they don't have bullets. He told me that. He said it, that sometimes they're not even well equipped. And some he also says that they're not even given order. Several times, 
So this has been going on. They will say they are not even giving order to carry any action. They're not giving order to kill. Yes, I'm not just supposed to kill anybody, but there should be a justice system that where arrest should be um, should, 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 should be taken proper and also investigation. Where is our DSS? Where are our intelligence officers? The immigration officers, the customs um, officers, how are they allowing people um, coming in, 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 into the country just like that? How are they getting, because most quickly, of these quickly are here, uh, Quickly here, uh, Lawrence, uh, before I go uh, to Kaduna State, uh, have you also heard uh, some community people, especially uh, on the other side, say this is more like uh, a reprisals, uh, that the Rigua people are also hide in the fact that they too, in the past, have carried out attacks against these people in, uh, on their community. Yeah, um, I read a statement like that. That's why I started um, mentioning an organization that um, Coalition of Plateau State Peace Practitioner. They made the statement on behalf of the Fulani, but we didn't hear the leaders of the Fulani saying that themselves. So I don't know how they make that. And I don't know where it is that reprisal is an attack, is an excuse to reprisal. I don't know. Why not report it? Why not take yeah, it to so, take so action? In other words, in other words okay. there's, been, there's been casualties on both sides, uh, on the Rigwe side and on the Fulani side. We've never, yeah, I'm telling you this, I stay at home. We've never count any casualties of a Fulani in any of our community. We don't know that, and we've never heard of that. So, uh, as a we youth, only get uh, as, to a, as a youth, so, sorry to cut you. I'm just trying to see how much we can cover before we get to Kaduna and come back and wrap up. As a youth association, what have you done to bring the the young people, especially those who look up to you and others in the in the association in your communities together, to try to salvage the situation? We from our community. We undergo a lot of um, trauma and forgiveness processes, process in the community. And we've done that with our youth, calling them to order and having programs by organizations, the Finance Foundation, HD, and some other humanitarian organizations coming up to see the reason of um, forgive, to forgive our enemies at all times. And it has come to an, I am a day that We've been, let me just say it's not more than, it's not up to a week whether we sign uh, an agreement, but some of those things we have to just do it to accept some processes but that, yes, there should be peace. But whenever we go to such type of meeting, there will be attack immediately. But we've been doing our best organizing meetings organizing and also making we published series of statements calling on each way everywhere don't take any reprisal if we're to say that with what's happened to us if we're going to fall for a reprisal who are we going to kill who must we go to um Rafimbona, where we know that these people are they have arms do we have the arms no we must call on peace for our own people and we say to go to Marbandir, where they are, we've been telling the, uh, the security, this is where these criminals are. They should visit them. It's not our duty. So we've been doing that a lot to our youth to tell them, come and take a peace process is the best. Well, and I think, I think, I think that's, a, that, that's, a, that's a good move. And, and we do hope that uh, when uh, the government and the military authorities uh, are uh, are reached to come on the show, they should be able to talk to the Rigwe people and communities uh, on what else they're doing, you know, in addition to what uh, your body of youth are doing to ensure that peace, uh, you know, is established in your communities. Let me quickly go to uh, Kaduna State where we have uh, Nura. Nura, thanks for your patience and your time. Uh, good to know you're still there for us. Uh, quickly here, how important is the understanding of the history of settlements in solving these challenges? Because listening to you, you took us down memory lane talking about, you know, uh, different settlements. Considering the Zango Kataf crisis has been happening, uh, not just now, but for a long time now. 
Thank you very much, sir. Um, understanding the history of settlement is very important. Sense that it will enable people to know where they come from and where they are heading to. As for me, Zongo Urban, just like what I have said earlier, was established about 500 years ago. And we, we are not afraid of telling, of telling anybody about our history. We all know that every settlement is established as a result of migration of people from one to another. And Zongo is not an exception. Zongo was established by one melee. That melee is very, very from Baga. He first lived in Borno, uh, in Kauru before he came and established Zongo. In all our history, we are not changing the place. So it's very important that people should know their history so that they can be able to know where they, they are heading to. So, it is not the history itself more than matter. What is very important is that Nigerians, as Nigerians, we have to embrace ourselves as brothers. We believe that. We believe that if, if as Nigeria, we can embrace our brothers, this peace will be maintained. But, you know, like a town that was established about 500 years ago, up to now, to them, we are settlers. Now, my question here is, how many years are we going to live in that area for us to be considered as indigenous? How many years are we going to live there for us to be considered indigenous to that area? So what I'm saying is, I call on my brother, irrespective of the language they speak, their religion, whatever, irrespective of their historical antecedents, in order to describe what, what is family, what is Popularly known as indigenous secular recovery in government government. Because this is something that has been raining for long. And it is something that is instigating violence and more violence still and this. So even though able to everybody, nobody on earth has no history. Everybody has a history. And even the Asians that we are claiming or not sony to the land, they have history of migration. We have great in the national archives. We have great in many places where they migrated from. Nobody springs up from, from, from the ground, just as we claim. They claim that they sprang up from the ground. And it is not possible. This is a special statement. They too migrated. So therefore, we have to forget about all these things in order for us to embrace one another. So that peace can be maintained. Peace can be peace, peace can reign in our land. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and thanks for your time. And uh, let's uh, quickly get to uh, Lawrence in Plateau State. Pla uh, Lawrence, uh, you've heard Nura, and uh, uh, it would seem as if uh, both of you are on the same page. Peace uh, and uh, dialogue. And of course, uh, uh, his modern ones use the word brothers uh, to describe those uh, that have carried out such attacks on them. Uh, was as hard and painful as that is, he still sees them as uh, brothers. Now, what's the ultimate solution? Uh, you've seen it all, and you've been there. You're still very much there. Uh, what's the ultimate solution? Justice system. Nigerian authority from the federal should, should, should put justice system first, after justice system, after justice is being done, and rebuilding of these houses because it's an intentional um, act to see that um, nobody is there so that Fulani should occupy that place for as the grazing area for Ruga. We kind of observe that. So justice system, government should, should ensure there is justice and also rebuild those houses and also roof them out. All, more than 500 houses. Where would they stay? It's rainy season. If only the federal government can do that, we'll know that, yes, they're not involved in this practice. If they can rebuild those houses, yes, yeah, several times they did rebuild others. We did that. Some Christian organizations have been helping, her, helping us. But government should buy us. Government should do what is the needful to rebuild those houses. Buy things for us. Rebuild them. They should do that. Once if that is done, and also and undergo arresting those criminals to see that because even when they rebuild them, they come back and bond them again. Arrest them. 
They know where they are. They all know it. They know where to get them. Once if they can do that, it also helps. Then we can take peace process, dialogue process after rebuilding those houses. It's very key because if we can do that, if dialogue will not go into, where all effort is going to be at loss. Rehabilitate those criminals after going to prisons. Take them to a correction center. I'm not even calling for their killings or they should kill them. No, we can't, we, we can't stand on death to death, um, human rights violation to human rights violations, human rights abuse to human rights abuse, abuse. No, they should see how these people, they should bring them to let them understand the importance of life. They don't know how life is so very precious. They make life to be as cheap, like, like, like a salt. So I think they should, they should kind of bring them to an extent. They should understand the importance of life. There is actually attitude of illiteracy among these planets. Most of them who are staying in those places, they should teach them. There are certain things that if you don't know about how precious life is, you look at life of any other religion or any other tribe is as you have. And let me create a lot of such attitudes, bringing on our people to have a human rights education for them, which is so very key that if Lani will know this, if Boko Haram will also know this, how important life is, after arresting such um, people, train them on how important life is. It will help us. And such training, not only the criminals now. We should look into how to start training people to know the precious, how life is precious in our own academic um, season. Anyone going to school, ensure that he learn how to protect life and see the life of each and every individual as important as his own life. Just because I don't want to be killed, I should ensure my brother or someone close to me not to be killed, not because of his own religion. The Nigerian government has faith in teaching people how to keep or to preserve life of Nigerians. Well, I think uh, I, I, that's a fine place for us to leave it today. And uh, you've actually said a whole lot uh, that the government uh, should also be looking into. I'd like to thank you very much for being such a nice company and thank you very much for uh, these important details. Uh, Lawrence Zongo and Nura Zongo. There's nothing more that should matter to any government than the well-being and security of its people. And when these are absent, governance becomes questionable. I'll see you tomorrow on VSA.